Okay, it's eight o'clock in the West Coast, 11 o'clock in the East Coast, five o'clock in Central European time. Welcome to this expert NIMSI panel discussion. Uh, to follow this meeting in English, click on the button labeled language selector in the bottom left of the screen and choose English. If you want to uh, listen it in other languages, uh, this uh, uh, session is being translated and interpreted live. Good morning from uh, Seattle. Companies with uh, global or regional operations have been busy trying to maintain a strong corporate voice as they engage with uh, global stakeholders. With the restrictions that have been imposed by social distancing, having effective uh, communications with multinational teams, partners and clients presents a whole new set of challenges and opportunities. After an initial deceleration, organizations are finding a way to push multilingual meetings online. But is this the end of on-site events as we know them? How are organizations adapting to the growing need for multilingual meetings and how are language professionals coping with the changes? Um, NIMSI has invited two leading global professionals to share how they are adjusting to the paradigm shifts we are witnessing. I am Renato Beninato, uh, co-founder and CEO of NIMSI Insights, and together with my colleague Sarah Hickey, I will be moderating this multilingual expert panel today. This meeting is interpreted into Spanish, Italian, Russian, and Chinese, a courtesy of Kudo. Hello, Sarah. everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Hickey, um, Chief Researcher at NIMSI Insights and connecting from Germany today. Uh, I'm also a conference interpreter and focus my work uh, in the interpretation services and technology space. It is our honor and privilege to introduce our expert panelists today. We have Maria Ochoa. She is the language manager at the World Bank. Previously, she was the chief of language services at the Organization of American States. Maria has a degree in legal translations from the University of Buenos Aires and a master's degree from the middle oh master's degree it's actually two <laughs> from the Middlebury Institute and Georgetown University. Then we also have Salvo Jamaresi. Uh, he's the head of globalization at Airbnb. And before that, he led the localization departments at PayPal, Yahoo, and Homestore. Salvo has a PhD in Computational and Applied Linguistics from the University of Palermo, where he was also a professor. But before we kick off this panel discussion, I want to give a brief overview of the market for both um, well, video conferencing and multilingual video conferencing, so that we all have a better base to start from. Um, already before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, the market for web conferencing software and services was considered a fast growing segment. But since the onset of the pandemic, growth forecasts have gone up significantly. Right now, the market is estimated at about $8.2 billion in 2020, and it is predicted that it will grow at 9.2% per year to reach $12.8 billion by 2025. All traditional video conferencing platforms, all the big names, have on average seen a 70% increase of daily meeting participants since the onset of the pandemic. And Zoom is the clear front runner in the segment. Well, that being said, it should come as no surprise that since the onset of the pandemic, um, the market for multilingual video conferencing has been booming as well. And while most providers fall into the about 20% increase bracket, some are reporting record highs of 250% more business since March 2020. And while video conferencing and multilingual video conferencing might sound very similar, it is important to know that they are two very different things. Multilingual web conferencing is a highly specialized field within the sector for virtual interpreting technology, or VIT as we call it. And big names in this area include, for example, of course, Kudo, uh, the platform we're using right now, and also Voiceboxer, Interprefy, and Interaxio, to name just a few. 
companies that operate in this sector have looked at traditional on-site conferences with multiple languages and have found a way to bring them into the virtual realm by adding remote simultaneous interpreting or RSI to online meetings. Okay, uh, now that we have a better overview, let's put it to the panelists. Renato. Sorry. <laughs> we have prepared a few questions for the first part of this program where Maria and Salvo will have a chance to share their views on these challenging times and what we can do to cope and adjust. Uh, in the second part of the conversation, we will be taking your questions. So make sure to ask them using the messaging button uh, on the sidebar menu and feel free to tweet about this session using the hashtag uh, RSI rules. RSI is remote the simultaneous interpreting, by the way. RSI rules is the hashtag. Sarah? Yes. And in order to take full advantage of the platform we're using today, I encourage Maria and Salvo to speak in their native languages. Okay, I think we're good to go. So I'm going to kick off with the first question uh, for Maria. Um, can you tell us how many official languages there are at the World Bank? Hi, everyone. Um, Official languages, the World Bank doesn't really have official languages or rather it has only one official language, which is English. Um, however, um, my team supports every language need that the, that the, that the bank may need. Uh, In-house, we support C, uh, six languages, the same U, uh, UN languages. There are English, French and Spanish, Russian, um, Arabic, and Chinese. However, any year we support between 50 to 70 um, external languages, depending on where the needs are. As you know, the World Bank is a big organization. They have different programs in different parts of the world. So depending on where the programs are, um, a, a, a need for a language um, may arise for a few years that then we don't have a need for. So um, that, that's how we work. Great. That's uh, yeah, great for us to know um, that it's so it's more no official languages, but about six regular working languages and then the rest is need based. Yeah, depending okay. on where you are. Okay, great. Pero uh, Maria, vamos a hablar un poco en español. Me olvidé de hablar español. Mis colegas argentinos. Maria, let's speak a little Spanish. Yes, I, I forgot to speak Spanish. I'm sorry. So if you had to compare how meetings happen before, because World Bank is an organization that is very multilateral. There are representatives from multiple countries and surely there's plenty of people who don't speak English. So how were these meetings carried out in the past with the general directors and how were the big meetings carried out and how are they being carried out today with uh, remote meetings? Do you think anything's going to change for the long term? Yes, the change has been quite dramatic. A very important distinction to make is that within the bank, everyone speaks English. It doesn't matter where the offices are, all the meetings. And I think even in the majority of meetings with our representatives, uh, of course, for a long time, there was mandatory interpretation into French. Truly, no one used this uh, service internally, but the interpretation service is extremely important with our external clients. And most of the times, there's different types of meetings. There are the conferences where we have interpretation where with our conference interpreters. There's a meeting in a country, uh, United States, France, or any important country. We book all the interpreters. Each one does their travels. And we always try to hire as many local interpreters as possible. But of course, it's not the case most all the time. And so we had our meetings, like everyone <laughs> held our meetings. And then there were the bilateral sessions with governments where many times we used uh, simultaneous interpretations. Sometimes we used consecutive interpretation, not so often con consecutive interpretation, but the interpreters were there on site. 
but it looks like all countries were quarantined more or less at the same time. And we had hundreds of meetings for the last quarter, but we couldn't have any meetings because there was no interpretation. So, I mean, we certainly did have interpretation, but we didn't have was a way to do it. And it's very important because there are meeting centers. So it's not just that it's one or two or three meetings, it's hundreds of meetings that are happening all the time. Yeah, for example, last year, our service our, in our department, we had about a thousand meetings. So these meetings were happening also in any part of the world. A major, There's a big portion that happens in Washington, but several others that happen in other countries. The World Bank also uses, uses WebEx. That's the platform that we use to communicate. We also use Microsoft Teams, but none of these platforms had the interpretation feature. So we tried to do consecutive, but clearly it wasn't a good enough solution. So also I need to clarify that within the bank, we have a remote interpretation studio. And this is a studio where we do distance interpreting, but this was uh, connected and it was working quite well, but since the bank was, the building of the World Bank was also closed down, then we couldn't use it. So that's when we started to resort to platforms such as this one, such as Kudo. And in about two weeks, two weeks, that's how much time we took to organize ourselves uh, from zero meetings that had, like me zero meetings we were going to have from March until July, we could achieve 120 meetings because we could start to use a platform that could allow simultaneous interpretation. Uh, and, and ask Salvo, because Airbnb is a, is a complex system and, and with travelers and hosts in almost every country in the world, which brings a lot of complexity to communications. In which scenarios, because it's hard for me to, to visualize a scenario where Airbnb is, is using remote simultaneous interpreting. Sì, Renato. Eh, e allora, con Airbnb abbiamo avuto interpretazione con la pandemia perché abbiamo avuto eh, la necessità di parlare direttamente con i vari eh, host e, e non c'era altro modo più veloce che avere una video call e avere interpretazione remota e quindi è stata per noi una cosa risposta che è stata perfetta now I'm confused. Should they speak English, Italian? <laughs> uh, I don't no. know what it was like for everyone else, but I didn't get any interpretation from Italian and, uh, into English. Would you like me to repeat it in English? No, I just want to, just in case there's an, an issue on anyone else's. Sorry, there was a technical issue from Italian into English. Now we are able to hear you One, two, three, test. Yeah. Complex environment, like we're dealing here, right? This is a, a classic example of a conversation with uh, none of us has English as a native language. Uh, Sarah is German. Uh, Maria is Argentinian, Salvo is Italian, I'm Brazilian. Uh, each one of us speaks a different language. Interpretation becomes really, really key. Can you think of any uh, uh, um, situation in your, I, I can see in the, the World Bank, can you think of any situation in the, the Airbnb scenario where you have this, this kind of complex environments where before you were using English and, and maybe right. machine translation for that. Uh, uh, how has that happened? Is it a, a two-way conversation or is it mostly one-to-many? Well, 
in, inside the company, of course, within Airbnb, we speak English, right? Everyone gets hired and they have to speak English. Um, I guess where interpretation becomes key is when you're talking now to, a, to an audience and you don't have clear visibility if they all speak English. Then, and you're communicating info that is, needs to happen right away and you cannot expect a, a delay uh, that you would have if, let's say, you pre-record some information. And so in that case, mm -hmm. interpretation becomes key. It's direct. It's the, the quality is very high, uh, depending, of course, the provider that you use. And, and so that's where I, we think at Airbnb, and that's where we applied it in Airbnb. Uh, but within the company, you're right. Within Airbnb, we all speak English, and so we don't need that internally. And I spoke English. I was supposed to speak in Italian. <laughs> I'm confused as well. <laughs> We're not actors. This is real life. Exactly. Uh, Maria, una pregunta, una curiosidad que tengo yo. Cuando... So, Maria, just a question I have out of curiosity. Before, you were saying that World Bank has, a, has its own team of interpreters. So how does this combination work of using your team of professionals and the platform? Do you work with the professionals from the World Bank who adopted a new platform? Or do you work with a marketplace of sorts where you would find specialized interpreters who know how to use the platform? How did this transition uh, take place? Our interpreters, are all freelancers, freelancers, excuse me. We do have some translators who are also interpreters and they work, for example, in Moscow and in Cameroon. But in Washington, all of our interpreters are freelancers. This is, of course, a blessing and a curse at the same time. The blessing is that they're not working uh, for us all the time they have a lot of but they have a lot of experience but since they work for other organizations they've also been able to test out other platforms so we learned quite a lot from everything that they told us uh, the interpreters who work with us or work for us they they tried out all of the platforms that were out there uh, and they were generous enough to share their experiences with us so that was a huge advantage for us Excellent. And fascinating, uh, Maria, um, because I was going to ask you if you had experienced, if you experienced any challenges, maybe with the interpreters, you know, switching from what they knew to go in uh, remote. But in this case, then it was the opposite. Yeah, they already, they were the ones uh, that came in with the existing knowledge or experience about remote interpreting and they uh, helped you a little bit with the transition then. Yeah. Well, of course, it was it was super challenging for everybody, I guess. And, and I don't think the interpreters had fun really doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of them, I would say, prefer to work in a more controlled environment, right? That is the key in interpretation mm -hmm. to be able to see and hear clearly. If not, you will lose a lot of the a lot of the content, right? Yeah. It creates additional stress that you don't really need on top of already the on top of the stress of interpreting. Um, we did have to provide uh, training for for many of our of our interpreters, but mm -hmm. um, we work with very professional people, and 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 they were really. I mean, of course, they were accepting our support and welcoming our support, but they really took the the lead and did a lot of research on their own and did a lot of testing. And I cannot tell you the amount of testing that we did, how many hours of testing mm -hmm. before each one of these. 120 meetings that I'm telling you we did uh, and, and it, it may be more I mean this is the last time that I went and, and counted um, we had at least two or three sessions of testing so we had interpretation testing we had moderator testing we had client testing we had all sorts of testings and still you know some things happen like today when channel is not working this or that <laughs> yeah. but they, they, they were really really uh, very um, very professional, and we are so grateful for, for all their help. Mm -hmm. Salvo, uh, quante lingue avete usato per interpretazione? 
Salvo, how many languages did you use for your online meetings? We've used eight languages because we thought that there were the, those eight languages were more valuable, also taking into account the timing of our events and the countries that were logged in. We chose the afternoon, so we decided to go with countries that could connect at the time and join in and listen, and we picked our languages. And how did you select your interpreters for your meeting? Uh, we ask CUDA to suggest interpreters. We have analyzed the needs of our clients and vendors and uh, tested platforms. We found that CUDA was uh, the most um, right for our team where we gave um, importance to quality first Therefore, we chose CUDA. We trusted the, the team, we trusted CUDA, and we had a great feedback from our clients and listener. So we had Maria that is all used to buy those uh, video conferencing services. No, we never did. We always went through written translation instead. And this was a change for us. We translated web pages and content and we never used interpreting before. So this was our first experience with Airbnb and interpreters. And it was positive for us, I'd say. It was a fast change. We reached out to Kudo and in the span of a few days and weeks, we had a team of multilingual interpreters and a platform, and we didn't have to face an obstacle or know what to do. Kudo thought everything and organized everything for us. So do you think that this is a behavior? I believe that it was uh, the CEO of the company reaching out to you, to you. So what was your experience with the CEO of Kudo? Because what I say is a kind of mindset shift towards remote meeting. Beforehand, you didn't have those online meetings with interpreters and now it's a new market. Yes, it's true. I, I was working in Yahoo and PayPal first, but also in, in Airbnb, I had I had given a couple of guidelines and asked for interpretation, but before uh, the pandemic, the answer I got from my team was, yes, fine, it's a nice to have, but we don't need interpreting right now because everyone speaks English and uh, you will have written translation provided to the team and to the client, so it is not needed. So they will get the information in their languages with a little, bit, with a little delay, but with the emergency, with the COVID pandemic, everyone understood that it was not okay to have a delay and the communication must be uh, instant and direct, so we switched to interpretation and having remote simultaneous interpretation helped us, Airbnb, to speak directly with our clients in real time. There is no other way. It was the right way at the right time. So as you said, as you mentioned, now we understand better the, the value of interpreting. said you did a lot of testing you invested a lot uh, in making uh, multilingual meetings work for you remotely as well uh, same as you Salvo as well um, actually yeah I guess for both of you ever wants to take it first how do you feel like this is going to impact your work uh, going forward I mean right now during the pandemic you know it kicked off uh, the need for remote simultaneous interpretation for a lot of companies and organizations. Um, but what about after? Do you feel like you will go back to like 
for example, at the World Bank, only on-site interpreting, or will you do a mix, or Salvo, do you think it's going to stay? Um, I probably shouldn't have passed it on to both of you at the same time, but maybe Maria first and then Salvo. <laughs> Ok. Um, no, no creo que las cosas van a volver a como eran antes. No, I don't really think things are going to go back to the way they were. At first, at the very beginning, for example, the first month, all of us thought this is temporary and this will make do for the next few weeks. We'll see how it goes. And everyone was patiently waiting because what everyone wanted was to have their meetings in the first place. But then we really got used to it and we saw, hey, this isn't so bad. There are many benefits to having meetings online. So I think that since we had so much practice, uh, since we had to do it so many times, we could see that we could really combine both elements. And I think that that's really what's going to happen going forward. I think and I hope from my own point of view as an interpreter, this is my, uh, this was my uh, main educational training. I hope that we don't substitute everything with uh, remote interpretation because there's a lot of things that are missing. For example, you miss content or you, you miss different nuances. This is inevitable. I find that these big conferences and meetings where we need to make very important decisions, I think that these should continue as they were before. This is still the best way to do it, I find. But there are many different types of meetings that can be done virtually. And there are several types of meetings that before it was impossible to do with interpretation because it was so expensive but now we see that we can do it at a very decent cost so we can add even more services in other sectors that we had never thought possible before because before everything was difficult so i think that's that's the the path forward and of course we also need to uh, well not me because i'm not the expert here but these platforms are going to continue to improve. And so they need to improve in ensuring the best quality and not only sound in connection, but not only on the platform in and of itself, but also the whole entire planet needs to work on uh, providing the best connection and best sound possible. And when we can have these excellent conditions, the more possible these meetings will be. And I think that it's also going to help local markets. It's going to help a lot of interpreters who are in other countries that aren't in big cities, because of course we all know the biggest interpreters, they move to New York City, they move to Paris, they move to where the market is so there's not so much of a regional development so for me in order to be able to have access to this platform and give work to local interpreters is a dream come true and that's what i imagine is going to happen going forward i don't know if it will be the reality i'm not sure if anyone has any other expectations way as well I, I don't think we're gonna go back to how it was before i think the fact that we now have this as a, an option now we know it's an option before we thought it was hard to do hard to implement but it's now one of my offerings of my of what of our organization offers to the company and so now we can ask if you're having an event do you want it with rsi and before we, we couldn't even ask because we didn't have it and so uh, I think um, in, in the, where we are in the environment where we are with the virus and even 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 after the virus, I think uh, everyone speak to the customers where they are and how they prefer. And uh, and so I don't think we're, we're, we we will go backwards. Uh, salvo, uh, una domanda che c'è qui dei partecipanti è che nella, nella prima intervenzione che hai fatto non c'è... Just one question, please, because I, for, there was some... I, I wanted to repeat the question that we asked you initially. So what kind of events do you... Do you uh, do you use at Airbnb where they require interpretation? Yeah, well... As far as Airbnb is concerned, RSI is applied, is, is used for events when we reach out to the Airbnb community. And that is something, for example, that we have done 
during the 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 at the height of the COVID pandemic when we needed, of course, to 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 reach out, to speak very fast, very quickly, very immediately with the people out there. And indeed, there were people maybe who were out there. They were maybe uh, renting a place. They were about to leave, so we had to reach out and communicate with them very quickly. And that is something that we needed to do. So that was extremely effective. Uh, let me ask you a question because you're a conference interpreter too, uh, and and it's fascinating here to be in this uh, uh, situation. You've been analyzing the market. You've been um, uh, presented to all the platforms that are available in the market. What do you hear is the biggest challenge for RSI? Well, initially, um, a few, well, a year ago, actually, we still called it uh, not just RSI, but virtual interpreting technology. We called it a uh, solution without a problem, right? And nowadays, it's become the solution to the problem. Yeah. So, um, the, what I hear from, there's different things I hear from different sites, uh, from the interpreting community um, that I'm, of course, still very close uh, to. Um, yeah, a lot of interpreters were concerned, you know, that uh, about the the technical aspects. Yeah, that you know, what if I don't hear people properly? You have to handle all this new technology, and you're already focusing on the interpretation, and now you have to handle all these new buttons and technical difficulties. And how do I hand over? Of course, um, a professional platform like Kudo has a, a solution for that: the handover buttons. But it's all new, and then. Uh, interpreters are talking about like a certain it's I think people refer to it as a zoom fatigue as well but it, mm -hmm. uh, it also is applicable for these uh, types of meetings so from the uh, interpreting community there was a lot of concern in that area uh, mostly around the technical difficulties but then some people just um, I think preferred on-site as well for the human aspect and from the side of uh, providers and like companies um, there was a lot of client education needed in the beginning, maybe like you said, Salvo as well. Um, people were aware of it, but didn't think they really needed it. And then once the pandemic hit, everyone needed it and everyone reached out and the companies were overloaded and had to onboard more people overnight to meet all the client demand. Um, and then I guess from the side of the users, there's a lot of um, education needed as well. I think a lot of people uh, like that they have the option now um, to have uh, meetings in multiple languages for in their sitting room because maybe some never had this experience before. They may not have gone to multilingual conferences and it's very convenient and exciting as well. I think like I love it today that I um, can listen to Salvo and Maria in their native languages, of course, in English, but it's fantastic and seamless. Um, but yeah, so I think it's just the, the novelty aspect and then... I, I wonder how many people are doing like I'm doing, it's just going from one language to the other. <laughs> that is the fun part. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, what I was doing. One, yeah. one of the things that I used to find funny in events is that there is this, this shame, right? There are some people that their language is not that good. And, but they're ashamed. They don't want to put the headsets because it's going to show that they don't know the language. And here in the privacy of your home, nobody knows, nobody cares. Exactly. So it gives better visibility to the interpreters. <laughs> yeah, that is a very good point. I was interpreting once at a conference where the Germans wanted to show how good their English was the whole time. And so only yeah. half of them put the headphones on and didn't understand enough then. But I think if it was in a setting like this, they would have chosen the German channel then. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's, it's it's quite uh, interesting how how this thing goes and one one of the points that i liked from what you mentioned maria is the fact that uh, it it democratizes interpretation in the fact that you can have people working from home in different locations one of the things that i observed in 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 the briefings and the conversations that i've been having with people is that the the impact on behavior that i see in the long term is that before uh, if you were a delegate for an international conference, let's say a, a board meeting uh, at uh, an international entity, not let's say the United Nations or something like that, if you weren't there, you wouldn't have had access to interpretation. So today, it's not only we talk about remote interpretation, but 
the interpreter can be remote, the speaker can be remote, the participants can be remote, or any combination of these players. Now, location became irrelevant. So the, the point that you made, Maria, about the cost of, of travel, which was a, a big chunk of uh, one of the things that prevented and I don't know if you have any insight into the budgets and savings that you've been having on on travel with interpretation is is there any number that you can share with us or just broadly not exact numbers sorry unfortunately I wouldn't I wouldn't want to share any numbers because I, I didn't I did research research yeah. didn't do the proper research for this but um, but uh, Absolutely, there is there is a lot a lot of savings, not just for the interpretation, but for the for the for the travel cost in general, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so my point to, uh, um, about about not traveling is is especially for these um, short meetings, like maybe one day meetings, mm -hmm. things like normally you wouldn't do. Two hours, right? Exactly, like the same the same happened when when the when the systems the the the, the um, this conference um, system started right at the beginning there were a lot of people that wouldn't really be able to attend a conference because it was just for one day now you have these virtual systems and then people can attend those conferences right mm -hmm. so the same with interpretation now we have these systems that offer interpretation so in the past you would have a virtual conference but without interpretation and people would just have to you know pretend they speak English or try to understand as much as they can and now they can actually attend and participate and their participation can be meaningful so so I think in that sense it really adds an advantage right without really trying to go back and take take everything to virtual because maybe that's not the the ideal um, at least not for now but it, it does add a, a whole new um, spectrum of opportunities that, that we can have because of this yeah, and um, oh, yeah, go ahead, I, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add to this briefly because I was speaking to someone uh, not too long ago. I was interviewing someone about this, and they were pointing out that it increases participation because before even um, people may have you know understood enough English, but they couldn't participate as much in the debates. They couldn't you know express themselves uh, well. I, like even I remember when I first um, was going out with my husband many moons ago when we had an argument, uh, like I'm a champion at arguing in German, but in English, I mean, I was a little he bit, was lost. he was always winning <laughs> because I couldn't express myself that well, you know? So, but in German, I would have, you know, I would have won. <laughs> so I think it's an international debate as well. People are not participating as much if they're maybe not as confident or they cannot express their view as well. Whereas through interpretation uh, anywhere, whether it's on-site or remote, of course, that, um, that helps the situation significantly and people still underestimate it and of course so with remote to promote kudo for uh, marital fights maybe maybe yeah <laughs> maybe that's another <laughs> business line <laughs> no and with remote it's also yeah it's opening the door to new markets good idea renato i wasn't going to go that far but it does also open the door to new markets i think yeah and, and i would i and i would emphasize also i think the 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 the, the key for us was the Quality. I think before this, uh, we had some answers to how we could do our, our RSI, but you had a delay, you had maybe only within audio feed and at the video feed. I think the key for us was to see how, and the, the, the kudo is, you know, it, 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 that's where I think it, they're very, you know, it, it, it is awesome what they do, is how no delay, high the, the quality is very high and that i think is why it's easier now mm -hmm. to have this as an offering before it i had offered it before let's say and it wouldn't have been so good i don't think it would have gone well right then there would have been a bad you know it would have been it, it, it would be okay for people to say no we will go with english first and then hold off for a few days allora, salvo, torniamo all'italiano. Dimmi, Renato, l'italiano uh, è meglio. So, salvo, back to Italian. Yeah, yeah, I love speaking Italian with you. So, you were saying that now this is a sort of additional service that you provide, that your company provides, and, uh, well, basically, the number of languages available has doubled 
Yeah, 62 languages, 62 languages. Yes, indeed. And that's something that we do uh, concerning articles, web pages, email, any sort of communication uh, by Airbnb. Indeed, it's localized, let's say. This was a remarkable leap forward, I think. And which are the internal clients who now can be more interested in interpreting, for example, that didn't consider interpretation at all in the past? Well, I, in my view, as I said earlier, if you want to talk directly with uh, uh, the hosts or the, the guests that you have, we have a community, as you know, Airbnb is a community. We are not owners of the houses, so we are not guests. So we basically uh, have uh, uh, hosts uh, and uh, people who want to go somewhere. And so the various uh, organizations uh, who want somehow to rely on Airbnb to assist the people who are guests somewhere can definitely mm, take advantage of remote interpreting. And that's because we've made it very clear and it is very clear to them that this is a, a real option for them. That's great. That's great. And uh, I'll, I'll, I don't know. Uh, because this would be a question for Kudo, but Maria, you probably have information about this. How uh, do you test interpreters before they start on the platform? Is that a process that you had to go through? Yes, we we did uh, we did test. Uh, we we basically we prepare we organize a separate meeting the day before. Um, usually, it's the day before. Um, and they test um, the equipment. The interpreters have very uh, sp specific requirements for, for equipment, um, including headsets and mics. And, um, and so we test, uh, we test all of that to make sure that all the, and also the interpreters go through some sort of certification, right? Where they okay. learn yeah. how to use the system. So that's the first, the first part. First, they take a, um, I believe it's a tutorial first, and then and then they have the actual the actual meeting with the with the experts, and they have a, at least in Kudo they also have an interpreter that works training the interpreters, and they shows all the console and the buttons and explains all the you know the the good the good practices, um, you know shares bad experiences, uh, bad things that happen to other people, so so they can avoid. And so we do that that that's how it, it happens. Is a is a is a different training and it happens before the actual meeting. And then before the meeting, of course, they connect earlier, they talk to the operator, make sure that everybody is sounding all right. And, and that's how it goes. And Sara, you, you've analyzed all these this different platforms. Uh, I, I assume that the, the user interface for the interpreter is different from the one that we see here as speakers and as participants, right? Oh, uh, yeah, usually the interface is different because, for example, we don't, um, right now, we don't have, let's say, something essential like a handover button right now, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the interpreters that are working in the background, they need to coordinate with each other. So they have um, a different, um, yeah, a different console. So they can select the different uh, language channels for input and output and hand over to each other and communicate with each other as well. Um, so, yes, the consoles look different. Because that, that's an interesting point that I it had that occurred to me is that in, in a traditional setting, you have two interpreters in a booth and there is a lot of communication that goes mm -hmm. back and forth between the interpreters, uh, terminology help, uh, hey, I need to go to the bathroom and things like that, right? Like yeah. uh, 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 regular interaction. But when you have uh, two, two uh, interpreters that are remote, completely remote, uh, you need the the you need to emulate that virtually mm -hmm. also, right? Yeah, so that, that's quite interesting because uh, uh, we were going to mention this at the end, but here we have uh, eight interpreters participating and doing the job. Here we have Ivana in New York doing Chinese. We have Vanessa in Monterey. So there are two interpreters in different coasts in the United States. We have 
Alice and Sara in uh, Turin, Italy. They're both in the same town. I don't know if they are in the same location. We have Igor in California and Olya in Sofia, Bulgaria, doing Russian. And we have Lara in Spain and Janet in Mexico City. So uh, I wonder how that thing happens, right? It's, it's quite, quite a, an endeavor, quite impressive. Yeah. From what I've seen in, on most platforms, uh, the interpreters have to do it via the chat function that they give each other a quick note. So you know, I want to mm -hmm. hand over soon. But um, Kudo has um, even put in a, a handover button. So there's a complex system where one interpreter can press a button that announces, I want to hand over soon. Then there's like a timer coming up for the other interpreter in that time they can get ready. And then so you can have a seamless uh, trans like a seamless switch between the interpreters, but yes, the it's more advanced. How did they say that that guy sounds stupid, the other one has a crooked eye, that kind of thing that goes in the booth, you they missed can that still, They can still chat. That's well. why they're not encouraged to use the chat, because in case you chat to everyone except to just one person, so that's what I've learned from our interpreters, um, not to never use use the, the platform's chat, chats, just in case. Yeah. And I also hear that they use an alternative uh, communications to, and so they keep each other's on camera all the time either using facetime whatsapp or any anything some something else so that they they can talk to each other and hear each other and i'm not sure how i wouldn't dare to say how the kudo interpreters are working uh, in the background here but that's what i've heard from the interpreters that work for us <laughs> yeah. yeah that's it's definitely how we adapt isn't it uh, I think it's maybe time to open up the floor to um, questions from uh, the audience, right? Absolutely. Let's uh, do it. Let's do it. If you have questions, please uh, type on the right side. You have that messaging button there. You can type your question. And if it is not a stupid question like Javi <laughs> just asked, we can <laughs> ask it to the rest of the group. By the way, Javi is my friend. That's why yeah, I'm... and it, it's uh, it's not a stupid question, but we already asked it. I think. So. Yeah. <laughs> the one I with it. thought his question was fascinating uh, because, well, I don't know. Fascinating, maybe it's too proud on my side because I always make the same. I always compare these platforms with with machine translation, which is what he was saying. Right? Is it going to replace or is it going to help? And, and what I think is that it's going to help rather than replace and, and open new opportunities for people, like I said, right? Mm -hmm. Same as machine translation. I would never use machine translation to negotiate a document, to read a contract, to read a book. But hey, I, 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 I do go to the Airbnb site sometimes and read, it, and read the reviews, <laughs> you know? And if I don't understand, I'll just plug them into machine translation to see is this a good place to stay or not, right? Well, you so can do it right away on our website now. So when machine I used this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, some time ago, I remember I, that's what I did. Same with Yelp and all these other things where there's a lot of right. customer feedback. I, I really want to know, is this good or bad? I, I mean, my decision is do I buy it or not? It's not really right, do I. Right, right, right. Um, it's key, you know, yes. So, so I do Sarah, think that, well, we, we can connect to this question because you've been doing research. It's very incipient uh, now, but is is there going to be room for machine interpreting? Is that a real threat? What's what's your feeling, Sarah? Because you've been talking to <laughs> people who are looking into this. Um, I am more on the controversial side there probably because, but I guess that's my job too, right? So um, I don't see it as a threat, uh, machine interpreting, but instead I see opportunities and room for it there. Yeah, for sure. Um, about, again, about a year ago, I didn't think that this technology was ready uh, in the sense that it was usable. Then actually, um, yeah, Renato and I did a little test where he was speaking Portuguese and I was speaking German. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun because there were a few mistakes, of course, but we were able to just have a phone call, uh, both speaking each other's um, native languages and we had machine interpreting at the same time. And yeah, I don't uh, think it's going to be a threat to human interpretation. Um, I think there's room for both and I can see um, 
use cases for it. Again, it can open up the um, market in some areas. It can be sometimes maybe the initial communication somewhere. It can also serve to preserve um, rare languages as well, or you know where it's harder to get uh, interpreters in certain languages and situations because you know life is not always perfect. It's not always you know oh we have all this time to go and find someone. Sometimes it just needs to be quick, like for emergency services, whereas maybe later you get an interpreter. But for the initial quick bits, you can use uh, machine interpreting or just to name some examples here. But yeah, if anything, I see the interpreting market not being made smaller and humans being phased out. I think there's plenty of room for humans on site and remote. But uh, if anything, we're allowing for more language access with all these technologies. So the market yeah, is expanding. I, I believe you're right on. I think we're going to see all over again the, the, the debate we saw with um, M T, T, right? Where everyone thought with MT, it's the end of our of this industry and professionals, and that was not the case. Uh, I think there's, op there's options where you might want to use MT, like we do for reviews, because the volume is just so big, mm -hmm. and there's no way financially we could pay for this uh, otherwise. But there are cases which we do often, very often, where we cannot use MT because we want to make sure the quality is higher. And so I think this is this you're going to see this all over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we have a good question here from Catherine Busman to to Maria. If there were any issues around confidentiality for the high level meetings that the World Bank had to vet the Kudo platform for, or uh, uh, this very, very high level meetings done in person. Is there a security element imagining that uh, some of these meetings are confidential for some time? Yes, huge issue. <laughs> uh, we didn't have a problem, but um, fortunately, but uh, it, it has to go through a very long um, security clearance process. And um, right now we are working with Kudo in implementing a private cloud um, where um, that, that ensures the confidentiality of, of the meetings because we, we do need that for, for a lot a lot of our a lot of our meetings. So I guess that is the part that has delayed the process the most because it has to go into the bureaucracy of security process. It's not something that can be done um, quickly. Um, we were able to start with the public meetings pretty soon. Like I said at the beginning, less than few, the less than two weeks, we, we were already we were already working. Um, but for the for the private cloud, we're only starting now. So I see that uh, Evandro has Evandro. joined us. Yeah, he has hello, more. hello. Good morning, Hi, everyone. Evandro. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. You Good guys want to? Yeah, you guys will have to excuse me. I promised I wouldn't show my face because this is your meeting, basically. But it's very hard for someone who is in this industry to pass the opportunity of talking to Salvo, Mario Ochoa, Renato, and Sarah at the same time. But I came here specifically, Renato, to tell you that of the many languages we have covered, Portuñol is not one of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So very quickly, I have one <clears throat> very specific question uh, for you. I also showed that because I want to encourage more of you who are following. If you want to show your face and ask a question live, you can do that. My question has to do with sign language. So I would appreciate to know if both for Airbnb and World Bank, if you see any, any emergence of requests for sign language. The more I look into it, the more I, I learn how interesting that the whole universe of sign languages are. We tend to, even people in the industry like uh, like me, again, I have to confess my my ignorance to, to a certain level. We tend to think of sign languages as just transliteration in gestures of another language. And that's not accurate at all. It's a, it's a totally different language. Some of these people uh, of our colleagues uh, who do sign language or who rely on sign language don't even uh, read some some of the other languages. So do you see uh, an increase for requests in terms of inclusion sign language and so on? Because we are working more and more in providing yeah. support to sign languages. Yeah. 30th anniversary of the ADA, the American with Disabilities Absolutely. Act. Absolutely. Yeah. Boosted mm -hmm. that significantly. Yeah, very Would good. Would you like to start, Maria, or do you want me to go? Go ahead. I can start. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, that has been asked within Airbnb, and uh, it, there is interest. There, we have interest to do that. Uh, 
uh, we haven't done it so far, but we are, we are, that, that is a big area for us, for sure. Very good. Thanks, Alan. Same here, because we do offer sign language for, uh, we have offered sign language interpretation for many of our conferences and meetings, and uh, we haven't had the chance to do it through, through this platform yet, but um, we're working on it because we're sure the demand is going to come up. Same thing that I was saying previously, right? At the beginning, we kind of got used to whatever we had. We had to work with it and we had an, uh, an opportunity to use it and we did. But now that we are more, we've learned so much and now we're going into the details and just making sure that nobody's uh, left out. And, uh, you know, one of those things is, is sign language. Now, Maria Ocho, when you do offer sign language, do you go for the international sign language or do you go for the specific languages like American Sign Language, British Sign Language, and Australian? Because eventually you have to provide another 62 languages, right? So. So in most cases, right. we offer American because they because it's for the meetings that are held here. But we have also done an international. Those are the two Excellent. That people Excellent. normally request. Very good. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what we asked also. If we do support it, which one do we support? Uh, yeah. So those are what, what, what we have to come up with. Yeah. Thank Excellent. You. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm out of here. We're getting close to, to the end here. Um, Maria, any uh, en español para que usemos porque la gente tiene que trabajar. Una pregunta que in Spanish so that people can uh, hear the English. And I speak this Portuguese, which is a mix between. Spanish and Portuguese, but one of the questions we we're asked is when we talked about accessibility for interpreters for the most exotic languages, as, as Sarah said, does this change the language mix that's needed? Or if an interpreter wanted to reach out to the World Banks to offer his or her services, which would be the path to follow? Not straight to you, of course. At the World Bank, we already have all of the languages and required. I don't think that we will open any more doors than the ones that we have. However, when someone is knocking on our door as an interpreter, then that person can send a note to interpretation at worldbank.org and just attach the CV in languages together with their experience so that we can include these people in our database whenever we are in need of that specific language combination or maybe if we don't have another interpreter then we may reach out to these people and what about inoctitude this is a language that i never got you have to ask our team coordinators if there is a language that exists and you've never heard of it, they will find it. Uh, it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun and you're talking <laughs> yeah. to smart people. So uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the support that we received from Kudo, giving us the platform for this conversation and also the following colleagues who have uh, participated that I mentioned before. Uh, the Chinese interpreters Ivana Cheng from New York and Vanessa Chin from Monterey. Uh, in Italian, Alici Bertinotti in Turin and Sara Cuminetti also in Turin. Russian, we have Igor Zobko in California and Olya Makup in Sofia, Bulgaria. And in Spanish, we have Lara Weaver in Seville and Janet Becerra in Becerra in Mexico City. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's do this again. This was fun. Yes, this and thank you also fun. to our wonderful panelists, um, Maria and Salvo. Thank you so much. This was super interesting. 
Um, I think what we're taking away is that there were some uh, initial difficulties, lots of testing, but that now we can see um, real use cases uh, for multilingual web conferencing that will also stick around and that there's a changed mindset happening in large organizations like yours as well. So I think we can expect to see and hear more. Yes. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was very nice to meet you all virtually. Yes. You Same too. Here. Thank you. Gracias, gracias. Pasiba, danke, obrigado, whatever. What <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Gracias.